at uh, 1.50 in order to allow time for the next group to come in and allow time for people to go to other sessions. Uh, and considering the, the theme for this year's conference, La Dolce Vita, a very positive theme, and I was, yeah, no, I heard that. I was, when I'm talking into this, I get a <laughs> terrible echo. <laughs> I think we need a professional like you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, that's better, isn't it? It seems awfully loud. Um, I normally speak loudly. So anyway, we're going to end at, a, at 10 of uh, 2 to allow exchange of contents of the room and allow people to go to other sessions. In thinking about the theme of the whole uh, Conference on World Affairs, La Dolce Vita, a very positive thing, the sweet life in some sense, positive. Uh, and in thinking about various movies that have been made that try to deal with the content or the themes of what the bleep do we know, uh, most of the films I could think of are very negative. Uh, 1984 or Brazil or other movies along those lines. And it's uh, my great pleasure actually to have the honor of introducing Will Arnst whose second biggest distinction is having lived in Judge Dale's house in Belfont, Pennsylvania. He first, though, uh, started to think about making films when he was in junior high school. And after uh, a long and varied career, which you can all read in your program, uh, he got the chance to put it all together and to make the film that brings you here. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Will. We'll talk about 15 minutes. And then we'll open it up to uh, questions from the audience. And uh, we'd like to get as many divergent views and as many different people asking questions. So think about your question carefully and try to keep it short. And uh, that way we'll hear from lots of people and get lots of answers. So now I turn it over to Will Arnst. Thank you. because they called us an aria, so that's all the singing we're going to get. Um, unless anyone here wants to sing, we can, we can do that too. So, uh, I, this, I didn't really know what to talk about today. That's nothing usual. Um, so I just thought I would, in this 15 minute thing, because there's so many different things we could talk about this, and this is a conference on world affairs. And I figured, my first thought was that means we're going to talk about who's sleeping with who. But no, no, I figured that's not right, this is vulgar, people are more politically correct than that. So we wouldn't do that. So I'm just going to start rambling, as I've already started, on various sort of different subjects and topics that people may find interesting in relationship to uh, world affairs of the latter type, not the former. So um, first off, it's sort of the question is why, what people always ask, you know, why did you make this movie? And there was a lot of reasons, and I'll sort of go through them in my ramble here. But the, sort of at the highest level, the most sort of fundamental level was, and sort of the most grandiose scheme, because I always start with grandiose schemes, is I wanted to change the timelines of the planet. <laughs> now, yeah, that's, that's, you know, that's kind of a little out there, right? That's the sort of thing if your friend says to you, you know, you very politely say to your friend, what have you been smoking? <laughs> you know, have you, you talked to your therapist about this? But I was, you know, relatively serious and crazy enough to try. And the idea of that was that the, the planet's been going along in a certain way for however long it's been going along. And it just seemed to me, and I know a lot of other people, that it was basically time for a shift. Now, people always talk about the paradigm shift, whatever that is. But basically, it was the idea that we've been sort of going along in this materialist track for, what, since uh, Descartes, I suppose, since Newton. Uh, things are very mechanistic universe, and science has been very much as opposed to religion. And they've got this split going where they're basically the scientists, uh, I remember, uh, it's not so bad now, but a few decades ago, if you were a scientist and you actually went to church, you sort of had to hide that. You didn't really tell, you didn't use the G word anywhere because, you know, they didn't, your, your colleagues would think you were, you had lost it, basically. And then, of course, you know, religious people didn't really like the scientists because they were still smarting over Galileo and that whole thing. <laughs> they, they still wondered why the Pope just didn't bump them off early and get it over with. I guess I shouldn't make Pope jokes now, but you know, they did that stuff. Anyway, um, so 
there was this whole thing going where science and spirit were very much sort of at each other's throat. I should say more, it's like science and religion. Um, and then I started getting involved in spiritual practices, oh, 30 years ago. Uh, read a bunch of books, and like I think a lot of people, when I first started reading the spiritual books, I figured, oh, oh, this is easy. I'm just gonna like meditate for two years and become enlightened. I mean, that's, you know, of course. I mean, I know it takes everyone else lifetimes, but that's not me. <laughs> so after eight years or so of that nonsense, I, I kind of realized that that was nonsense. And I uh, found myself a spiritual teacher and uh, joined my first cult. And, uh, <clears throat> yeah, that's the C word these days, cult. And that's something that, you know, I could get ranting and raving about. But basically this whole thing that if you have any sort of uh, spiritual thing outside of the norm, what society does to you is they slap the C word on you. And then suddenly you're in a cult and therefore everything that you do is related to cult-like activities. You know, they figure you always got Kool-Aid in your car. You know, your people are going to be drinking that stuff, and it's, you know, it's, it's what's true, you know, we do have Kool-Aid. I make jokes about it, so no one believes it. Um, so the whole cult thing, and they, and they do this, they slap it on. So I was in this, this practice for years, and we got bad press everywhere. Then the Cult Awareness Network uh, showed up. They were fun, Ken. Where the, that was the group, in case you don't know, where they hired the ex-felons to kidnap people to deprogram them. That was fun. Um, so I was in that for a while. And uh, the, uh, that cult, the weird thing about that cult, because they're all weird, is our teacher said everyone was supposed to uh, write software, create companies, make millions, and retire, which seems kind of odd. But I thought that was a good idea. I liked the millions part. I couldn't meditate, but the millions part I, I, I liked. So I did that. And then after a while, I left that whole thing. And then, um, then it was time for another cult. And that was the Rampa cult. Well, you thought the first one was weird. The uh, Rampa who's in the movie and is our most controversial figure because Rampa, well, it's a pronoun thing. When you see Rampa up on stage, it looks like this woman with the blonde hair and the red thing. But by the way, how many people have seen the, the Bleep movie? <laughs> how many have seen it two or more times? Okay, we're gonna jump to five. Anyone here five and up? <laughs> okay, the DVD's coming out, okay. If it's, if it's more than 10, someone will meet you in the back. <laughs> They'll throw you in the back of the van and deprogram you. It's true, you guys laugh, but it's all true. Anyway, so, so there we were. So I you know, joined this, uh, the next cult. And actually, it's kind of a funny story. When I went to, a friend was going out to see Rampa, and I thought, oh boy, channel 35,000 year old warrior. I mean, they thought Betty Crocker had flaky crusts. <laughs> this is flaky as can be. And I went out there with that attitude. I was just gonna sit back and feel superior. And after about two hours of listening to this, I said, oh my God, this is the real thing. And I, I was shocked. So I started, I joined cult number two. And um, a lot of the, uh, the stuff that's in the movie is part of the curriculum there. Now I had studied physics in college, so I was always interested in that. Um, so then, you know, I joined that and then uh, I got the bright idea to make the Bleep movie. And that was about the point I just thought, you know, I'm gonna t change the timelines of the planet. And the interesting thing about movies, like if someone just decides to do that, okay, you know, great, you decide to do that, how do you do it? Because what are you gonna do? I mean, are you gonna rent a hall and give lectures? Well, that's not gonna get very far. Um, and there's a whole thing about the media and the culture that is, you know, ripe for conversation. And of course, what the media does is basically if anything comes from outside of their box, they're gonna, they're gonna sit on it. So, you know, we ran into problems where uh, movie reviewers would review the movie, and that was always a, a thing. Basically, 70% of our music or movie reviewers hated it. They would say things like, um, the, uh, the scientists were, were, they, they were, they were all fake scientists, which drove me crazy because if you actually read the bios, most of them do have PhDs and have made some very remarkable discoveries. But so you got the whole media keeping the lid on society basically. And there's a whole thing there, and I hope people talk about at the conference, about how the control of information, and basically the whole idea is, I kind of think of the, the, the way the media trashes things that they don't, that are outside their conception. You know, and the obvious examples of this is like Fox and Murdoch and all that kind of stuff. It's 21st century book burn. I mean, it's really no different when you think about it. I mean, you know, what did, the, what did they do back when uh, a book would come out and the, the people in power didn't, didn't want you to read it? 
Well, they just grab the ball and burn them. It was pretty simple. Well, it's a little hard to do that now, especially with the internet. So the way that you keep the, lead, the lid on things is with the media. Because basically they can just, they trash something and everyone says, like my favorite trashy, and this really pisses me off, is the, um, the thing that I read in the uh, press about how the film was funded by the Rampa School. And so therefore, since it was funded by it, there's this hidden agenda um, of, you know, a recruitment thing, or there's this hidden agenda because it was paid for by the school. And I've read this in a lot of articles, people, I hear it all the time, and it's, it's so interesting to me because I've never done anything in the public before, anything in the media or anything like that. And I've always heard people always said, you know, the media makes stuff up. They lie all the time. And you kind of go like, you know, like you just shake your head, you go, yeah, yeah, we know that which is a little sidebar here. It's interesting that everyone knows that and everyone, myself included, kind of goes like, oh well, yeah, yeah, well, they do that. It's like, well, wait a minute, doesn't that piss anyone off <laughs> that they do that? Well, finally they pissed me off. And I started reading in the media how the whole film was financed by the Ramka School. And that's the one thing I knew wasn't true because I financed it from the money I made from software. So I wrote all the checks. I sort of joke, I wish they had funded, I'd have some more money left. But no, so that was one of those things when I started reading this in the, in the papers and reading it on the web. It's just so amazing how it's just, I absolutely knew that's like someone saying, that's person, you know, you didn't grow up with those two people. And you say, well, wait a minute, I did, I know, I grew up with them. They say, no, 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 you didn't. <laughs> I mean, it's that basic. And I said, holy shit, you know, if they do this to me, I mean, what, what is, you know, going on and on and on there? So there's a whole thing about, you know, when you decide you want to like change things out in the world, you know, you hit this wall of resistance. Again, this is, I mean, anyone who reads history for more than two minutes realizes that the people in control always want to stay in control because they like it. If you, if you buy anything from a film, it's because they're addicted to it. You know, they like feeling powerful and puffing their chest up and talking in front of people. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's, uh, let's see, what else did we do? So there was the media. Oh, and another thing that we sort of set out to do, the three, well, when I say we, I or we, there's really three of us who made the film. I sort of got it started, and then there was three of us, and we fought like cats and dogs to finally figure it out, um, do all this stuff. One of the things we wanted to do was just to provoke a discussion. Part of the reason we called the movie, what the bleep do we know, is because um, there was a certain point when we were making this, we realized, you know, we haven't got all this figured out, duh. We can't even figure out how to make the movie. So part of it was, uh, yeah, it took us many years. Um, part of it was just to get that sort of thing, like, look, we're not, you know, teachers, we're not gurus, we're not people saying, like, this is the way. Don't confuse this with uh, the more dogmatic religions that say, you know, this is the way, and if you don't agree with us, you know, you're, you're A, wrong, uh, B, going to hell, or I don't even what C is, I don't want to think about it. But you know, we want to say, no, this is just ideas, we're getting ideas out there, and it's for people to try. So the idea was to get, sort of our, our thought was that thinking for yourself is sort of a lost art form in the culture <laughs> these days. You mean, they, again, people, do people really want you, the people in control, or the people selling you products, do they really want you to think for themselves, for yourself? Well, they kind of really don't want you to think for yourself. I mean, they really want you to think that if your life is lousy, a better deodorant will get you over that <laughs> thing because you won't stink and then you know, you'll find the right person, the love of your life, and suddenly you'll be living like all the movie stars. And it all gets down to the armpits, basically. <laughs> so that's kind of what they want you to think. So the idea of thinking for yourself is kind of a lost art form. So we wanted to get, um, get the movie out there and get sort of a, a discussion and controversy going. Um, at first the controversy was a little hard to take for me because I'd never uh, done that before. And then I realized no matter what you do, you're gonna piss someone off. And kind of once I got, I realized, like we've gotten some emails, people have, are really, um, they're quite angry actually that we sell t-shirts on our website. They say, I can't, I can't believe you've done this. I mean, you're selling t-shirts, what's next? Next is going to be what the bleep dolls. <laughs> now, of course, the funny thing is, we've been thinking about in our box DVD set, we have little plastic blow up like of the, the cartoon characters. You know, the different cells that are addicted. We thought that would be kind of fun to do. So, 
after we got grief from people who said, you know, I thought this was very spiritual, but you know, you, I can't believe you're such racists. And we looked at each other and said, we're racist? Really? <laughs> wow, why? And they said, well, you had a Polish wedding. <laughs> you used the word Polak. And it was funny because Betsy, they said this to Betsy, and Betsy goes, what do you mean I married a Polak? <laughs> Her husband was there, he goes, yeah, I'm a Polak. <laughs> so, you know, once we kind of realize no matter what you do, you're going to make someone you know, angry and upset, um, that kind of got things a little easier. But a lot of it was to just get a, a discussion going and... And uh, I've heard stories of physicists almost getting in fist bites at cocktail parties, <laughs> arguing the, the points and uh, subpoints of the film. So I, I figure that's good. Um, <laughs> and that's pretty much my 15 minute ramble. So um, if anyone, and I guess it sort of worked because everyone, we have standing room only here. Um, so uh, that's it. And uh, from our shameless commerce department, the DVD did come out. <laughs> and uh, we were, for two weeks, we were the number two selling DVD on Amazon, which surprised uh, many folks. Um, certainly surprised them at Fox. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny, but the guys doing the, the thing at Fox, the previous uh, DVD release was, uh, they did The Passion. <laughs> so we all thought it was somewhat karmic, but they were like, well, this is going to be kind of fun because it's, it's kind of our... You know, it's our payback for having to sit through all those meetings. So they got to, they got to do us, so uh, that's just, you know. And the one thing about um, why eventually this, I had this idea to change the, the planet to whatever degree, why do it in movies is, of course, a question. And it's so obvious because it's the most powerful media we have. You know, someone, you get them, and I, I wanted it to be theatrical. I didn't want to just release a DVD, because if it's a DVD, you're sitting at home, you're in your box, you know, part way through, you're going to get up and have some pizza, um, or turn it off and say, I'll get, get to it tomorrow. So there's something about getting people in a place where they're just going to sit for two hours. And also, it was, uh, there's a whole thing about what I call the metaphysical closet. And this gets back to my first rant and rave about being in a cult. There are so many people out in the society that are in quote unquote cults. And I, we kept running into them um, at these things, and they, they're just like, they can't at work, they just, they have to hide their books, or they feel they have to hide their books. They can't say what they, you know, how they perceive the universe to people because they're gonna get labeled as a cult. You know, we talk to people afterwards and they come up and say, well, I'm, I'm doing this practice and it's so much is in agreement with what your movie's about. And I'd say, oh, interesting, what practice? And they would, they would <laughs> what was that? <laughs> so, the Avatar group. Oh, okay. You, you'd have to push people because they were so used to in this society everyone hiding in their metaphysical closets. The idea about getting it out in the theater um, was so that people, it's more of a public thing. You know, literally getting out of the closet. And we got a lot of emails where people would say the lights would come up and they'd look around, they'd say, oh my God, I'm sitting here in a room of 300 people. And you know, by and large, we all you know, enjoyed it and stuff we liked to think about it. And I thought I was the only one. <laughs> so it's for all the disenfranchised crazy people out there. <laughs> This is a thank you to the uh, wonderful city of Boulder. In our whole, we did a theatrical run, I think it was $11 million in the box office, but our biggest one week opening run of the entire thing was in Boulder. So, yay Boulder. Um, and in fact, I used to drive by that, uh, the Arapahoe thing, because I lived there part time, I used to drive by it. Just when I was even thinking about the movie, and I kept looking, I said, I'm going to play there. I want, I want the big screen, too. I want to play on the big screen. And it was interesting that when we finished the film, all the, we showed it to distributors. And we were all excited, you know, we showed it to distributors, and everyone said, well, it's kind of an interesting feel, film, one, two, I didn't get it. Three, there's no audience for it. They said, we know, look, we're in the business, you're just a bunch of crazy kids. Uh, there's no audience for it, so we're not interested. So all of them across the board basically said no. And I just heard uh, last month John Hagelin, who's in the movie, said he was at MGM talking to the bigwigs there about something different, and they, they were like, they descended on him and said, well, what do you know about this bleep phenomena? <laughs> he said, well, I, what, do, what do you want to know? And they said, well, first off, we, we knew there was no audience for it, 
Secondly, there is an audience. Thirdly, the, the, the release pattern of this is so weird. Not only, not only are we surprised that it's a, a hit, but we don't even know why. We don't get why people like this. Can you, can you help us here? Because we know there's a huge market. <laughs> but John, John's in a cult too. He, he uh, teaches at the TM University, so he probably you know, signed them up like all cult members do. And <laughs> gave them the Kool-Aid and they all had a good time. Okay, that's enough of me. Now, let's do the question thing. You can, how do you do the question thing? Well, I don't know. You've done a great job so far. Do you, do you have a yeah, I'm just, I'm done right Yeah, we'll just throw it open and uh, whoever, go ahead. I actually have two questions. One is, can you talk a little bit about accelerating the timeline? Can you talk a little bit about accelerating the timeline and explain that more fully? And the other is, I know you ran in a number of theaters where you ran, at least here was like six months. Uh, can you tell the pattern in other theaters how long you ran? And what's happened in the media? Who's reported the fact that you run these unprecedented number of months in the theaters? Okay, our big, our big uh, top theater was for a length of run was Tempe, Arizona. And I think they finally uh, stopped three weeks ago, but the thing ran there for something like 44 weeks. And this, is a, this wasn't like a big multiplex, by the way, where it sat in the corner shoebox and they played. This was, it was the only thing playing there in a nice 300 seat. Uh, thing and it played there for 44 weeks. I mean, it just, it was insane. Uh, after that was Seattle. We got, Seattle of course at first didn't want to touch it because it had romp in and romp was around that thing, blah, blah, blah. We finally uh, browbeat someone into opening it there and we played there for 38 weeks. I think Tucson was next with 34 weeks and then we had a whole bunch. I mean, um, in Portland it was where we, we filmed the uh, thing that was for 25 weeks and just all these, you know, six, eight month runs, which are basically unheard of. And the other thing that was weird about it is generally when you release a film, big first week, second week drops off, third week's a smooth, zero, fourth week you're thinking about the DVD. A lot of times we would release the movie, we wouldn't hit our peak until six weeks out. Um, so that was, the, that was the weird thing that the people at MGM can't figure it out. Um, Funnily enough, we haven't, if that's a word, funnily. Funnily enough, um, we, well, you guys laugh, so I guess so. Um, funnily enough, it was, uh, we haven't gotten much media coverage on this phenomena. And we've been pitching it to the media and said, look, this is strange, look at these numbers. And I did, I nerded out and did this whole statistical analysis of why it's so out of the bell curve. You know, we talked to arts and entertainment people and we said, look, this is out of the bell curve. And they said, what? <laughs> Nerd joke. Um, so, so they, um, they uh, yeah. So we were pitching this as being something that's very unique in the culture, and it's still, and we're a little puzzled as to why we haven't gotten more. And again, this is the thing about you know the media. Now, certain people have conspiracy theories and you know blah blah blah, but it's one of two things: either the film and the whole phenomenon. It's like in the movie, the Columbus's ships. They're out there, but they just don't see them because they're so outside of their conceptual framework. So it's just so odd. They just kind of look at the whole thing and blink twice and say, do you know the new reruns of Seinfeld are out? <laughs> that's pretty, I mean, it, it just, it, it just, it doesn't even go in one ear and out the other. It's not even, you know, it's in the next universe over. So that's kind of that. As far as accelerating the, uh, the timelines, that's an interesting one. I haven't really thought about that. I mean, really, how do you accelerate them? I think it's just, or accelerating evolution would be another way, I think, to put it. Um, you know, evolution moves by getting rid of the old and moving to something new. Or another way of saying is getting out of the box. Um, and, you know, how do you do that? I think that in some respects by, you know, how do new ideas come in? It always takes a while. Like when Einstein first came out with relativity, everyone thought he was crazy. And uh, it took many, many years about that. Quantum, again, everyone now, everyone has to agree that it actually is more or less true, but they still don't kind of understand it and it's a very different conception. So I think that, I mean, our point in doing the film was you introduce concepts, you get them out there in a compelling way, and you know, at a certain point, that's what you have to do. You just kind of step back and let the cake bake. So we're kind of in, in cake baking phase nowadays, so. You uh, yes, sir. I have a question for you. Okay, like when I got out of the movie was, okay, each of us is a part of the divinity, part of totality. Okay, I think why people are resistant to it is because of forcing blood
Let's ask a hydrogen molecule. <laughs> Stuart Hameroff has his whole model of consciousness. And according to him is when you get down to the basement level of the universe, the Planck scale, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, that, that kind of thing, down there there's information embedded in like the quantum phone. Mm -hmm. And it basically, his theory is consciousness happens when a, a superposition builds up in your awareness and you collapse, but it's somewhat based upon this information at the, the ground floor. So th certain things like ethics and morality are actually built into the the structure of the universe that way. It's a very, it's a really out there concept. So uh, that's kind of one thing. But the thing you said first about um, people, yeah, one of the things we do say in the film, and we go all the science and there's the spiritual stuff, is that um, everyone is divine. Everyone is God. And, and you know, that's one thing that we've, um, so, sort of the more fundamentalist religion have, have they don't like that idea very much. <laughs> Which is strange. I mean, and some other people really, um, like I went to a, a talk a few months ago, Rampa gave this public talk, and basically what he was telling everyone was, look, you're div everyone's divine. And after the talk, I walked out to a friend, and I said, well, I can't imagine someone arguing that point. <laughs> Walking out and saying, well, I'm not divine. <laughs> There's no difference than me and that dog or that, you know, that hydrogen atom. I'm, no, I'm not divine. I'm not a creator. I mean, it's such a it's such a, a concept when you know you, I just kind of wonder why someone wouldn't want to jump on that one. Now, one of the reasons people don't want to jump on it, it's the whole thing about accepting your responsibility. So basically, if you're divine and you're this is a whole bit about creating reality, and if you're creating all this and lousy things happen, to, quote unquote, lousy things happen to you in your life, then you have to say, well, I guess I created that. And one of the things that I see happening a lot in society now is this whole thing about blame and not taking responsibility. You know, the, the obvious examples are suing McDonald's because you spilled coffee on yourself. <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. I mean, it's just, it's crazy. And so um, that's one reason we've gotten a lot of uh, people, sometimes they don't like when you tell them that they're uh, addicted and creating the mess that is their life, so. So the answer to that question was yes. Yes. <laughs> no, the answer to that question is yes to hydrogen atom. Uh, another question, yes, sir. This isn't quite as profound. Uh, your next movie. Ah, the next movie. Well, um, again from the Shameless Commerce Department, um, I started working on that, and it's going to it's going to be called the Rabbit Hole version of this movie. And what happened in this movie? It's what uh, 108 minutes for all your Buddhists in the crowd. It's 108 minutes long, <laughs> and um, that was by design, by the way. Um, anyway, so it, and we had all these interview sections where we go and they talk about superposition, they talk about waves and particles, they talk about this. We filmed 60 hours worth of interviews, but we only have about an hour and quarter in the film. So we have a lot of more depth on all these subjects, but for theatrical release, we pretty well pushed the bounds of what we could, people would sit through on a Friday night. The rabbit hole version is going to be a three hour and 15 minute version of the film, where whenever you go into the interview section, it's a lot more detail, a lot more discussion. So we actually get more into the real science. We get more into some of the controversies that you know some of the scientists that we interviewed don't. They don't all agree. In fact, we did a conference in Santa Monica. Um, we're doing one in Boulder, I guess, in a month. And, and some of the scientists were in violent disagreement. And all the participants were like, "Wow, we didn't realize that scientists disagree. We thought you know science was like, no, no, no. It's a fist fight out there. And these you know, type things." So anyway, we're going to have a lot more of the controversy, a lot more details in that. And um, I looked at the operating system for the DVD players, and there's some tricks you can do. 
The one trick is, if the rabbit hole version, if you ever said how far down the rabbit hole you want to go, so if you put it all the way down, the movie then runs six hours. <laughs> uh, so you can really do it. And then, and then um, there's a random number generator built in. And the thing about quantum events is, at least on the physical level, quantum events are purely random. There's no way to predict them. So we're going to have the quantum rabbit hole version. <laughs> and when you click that switch on, basically every time you play it, yeah, every time you play it, it's going to be come out in a different order. So every time, yeah, every time you watch the movie. So my prediction is, like many people, uh, college students will be missing their class the next morning. They okay. Switch themselves out. Uh, yes. Okay, the question is, why do we stick the um, credentials of who the people were at the end? Because generally you put them in the beginning. And that's, that's an interesting question. Um, and again, that was one thing. Some people in reviews, uh, people were very violent about that. Why did you do this? I can't believe you did that, blah, 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 blah. And for people who haven't seen it, you know, we at the very end of the movies where we identify everyone. And on the one hand, it was, it was just an artistic decision. We had, in the editing process, we had stuck that section in all the different places in the movie. And if you put it in the beginning, what it does, it tells everyone, okay, this is a Novo special. You're watching a Discovery Channel special now, so, just, so everyone clicks into that mindset. And we didn't want to go there. We wanted this to be something different. We tried putting it at the middle, and finally during one cut, Mark, one of the other filmmakers, stuck it at the end. And the three of us just looked at each other and said, oh, it's perfect. And we didn't really think any more about it. That was kind of it. So afterwards, we got people writing and in Q&As were really pissed off. I can't believe you. I can't believe you did it. And so what we realized is um, we, were, we were not allowing those people their prejudices. <laughs> <laughs> really? Right. Prejudice is prejudgment. So if you see someone come up, you read the thing on the bond, blah, blah, blah. OK, I, am going, I will listen to this person. No, 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 this person's full of it, I will not listen. <laughs> and people, because we didn't give them their prejudices, they got pissed off. So that was, that was pretty interesting. And we did a test screening once, and someone said, you know, it was interesting. They went through this whole process. First, they were kind of waiting for it. And then they were, like, pissed off about it. And then about a third of the way through the movie, they realized that they were pissed off at this, but why did it matter? Because they just had to listen to the person. And by the time they were halfway through, they just forgot about it and were just into it. And sort of what we're saying is it doesn't matter. I mean, it's like people want the USDA stamp, you know, grade A beef on your uh, expert. You know, if you got a PhD from Harvard, you probably know what you're talking about. But as we all know, you can always find a PhD from Harvard that'll tell you anything. <laughs> so it's just they want that government stamp of approval. I mean, that's not bad. I mean, just because everyone has opinions, right? So we realized that by putting it at the end, and what we're saying in the film is like, you know, what the bleep do we know? Just decide for yourself whether these people make sense to you or not. Uh, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Uh, one of the comments about the film that somebody said to me was when they came out of the film, they felt smarter. <laughs> 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 and you're something different than they collected information as a result of watching the film. And I thought maybe they were speaking actually to they felt like they were objectively Did everyone hear the question? <laughs> Maybe, yes, no. I, very briefly, he said that when people came out of the film, they said they felt smarter. So he said it wasn't just information, but their brain actually worked better. And you know, could possibly this be a way of increasing people's IQ? Well, my thought on that is the brain is like a muscle, like anything else. And the more you, know, the more you use it, uh, the, the more it works. And we really push people in the film to using their mind. There's a part, certain thing, when we start out, we have a bunch of interviews before we get to the uh, Amanda part. And part of that was to get people, we were telling people, look, you're going to have to pay attention. You're going to have to use your mind in order to do this. Now, one of the things we realized, we were doing all this research because we all have the neurology in there. We found out there's this thing called, uh, I forget what, it, what the chemical is, but it's this neuroplasticity. 
And there's a chemical that gets re released in your brain that lets you rewire together your, your neurons much quicker. And something like, you know, little babies are wiring together, you know, I'm making numbers up, but something like five million neurons a second. When you get to be an adult, it gets down to two million or something like that. This is neuroplasticity. And so there's a bunch of things they found that increase neuroplasticity. Um, one of the things is a surprise. Uh, another thing, funnily enough, there's that word again, <laughs> is a laugh. After a good laugh, your brain is able to rewire much quicker. There's a lot of stuff like that. There's a lot of what we did, and this wasn't a, it wasn't a conscious thing. Uh, it just as artists, we did this, and we realized later, we do a lot of switching between the left and the right brain in the movie. There's all this science and stuff, and then we go to the Amanda part, where it's much more not so much talking, and it's kind of fantasyful, or the animation, which you can kind of turn your brain off. So we're, we're flopping back and forth between the two, and then there was stuff like the Polish wedding, where a good laugh you know, keeps everything going. So there was a lot that we were really working the brain over in order to do this. In fact, in one of the early scripts that we threw out, it started off by someone standing on a roller coaster and saying, basically looking at the audience saying, are you guys ready for a ride? You know, everyone goes to the gym and pumps up and does this whole thing, but when was the last time you did it for your noggin? So, you know, if you guys want to follow along, at the end, something's going to be different. So, you know, to answer your question, yes, I think there is something, you know, because of the brain chemistry. But again, you know, thinking for yourself is a lost art form in this culture. And kind of another thing we were doing is th this idea that um, it's kind of like exploring new ideas is actually fun. And Mark found this out, they did more neuro research, and then when you have one of these aha moments, it actually stimulates pleasure centers in the brain. That it's like it's a real high when you get, when there's something just clicks in the place that you never realized before. So these new ideas um, will do that. So a lot of the idea is, is, you know, how about a culture where instead of, you know, getting people stimulated by crashing up cars and shooting people in movies to get the adrenaline going, what about hitting a higher center where you're going to get a realization and just go, oh my god, that's so cool. So, thank you. Uh, yes. Oh, you get the mic because you're in the front row. Um, <laughs> Well, what I was going to say is that is that uh, it, it seems like um, I'm talking about smartness and talking about one's effectiveness in, in parsing their environment and understanding themselves, um, like. It seems as though that switching back and forth between right and left brain um, would would help in integrating the two parts, and and the greater to the, the greater degree that uh, a system or one's own brain is integrated would increase its effectiveness in understanding the world around it, and so it seems like it would make you smarter just you know, for those things. Um, and and also uh, my question is, to what degree do you believe that um, humans? Um, represent a leap or an increase in um, the ability for consciousness to control its own uh, uh, agency or self-conception um, in that humans can um, conceive a reality um, that is like reality but not reality and as such have this, this um, acceleration of the evolution process that all consciousness is from the most minute up to the largest systemic level um, exhibit, but but within, say, organic consciousness, right? Like, to what degree do you believe humans represent and a leap in that, in that we have this sort of feedback. Um, so the question is, basically, how are we different than dogs? <laughs> I have this, uh, it's a genetic defense, uh, defect, I always go for the laugh. It's a, you know, Polish wedding guy. Um, but that, yeah, that is, that is a, uh, I mean, to me, it's, it's, you know, one of those things is pretty obvious that, you know, because dogs aren't out there, you know, making things like World Conference, Conference on World Affairs and, and that kind of stuff. And, you know, the, the question is, I mean, this is an interesting thing about consciousness they talk about. In the early quantum days, they said, you know, the conscious observer is what collapsed reality. So then the, the, the whole thing became, what's a conscious observer? 
you know, well, okay, humans, let's take one step down, like dogs collapsing reality, or cats, you know, how about little mice, you know, ants, are they collapsing? And so the whole question of consciousness is, I mean, the sort of the question is what is consciousness? Now, it seems that there is a whole different thing in humans and that obviously our impact upon the world is vastly different than all the other animals. They're smart enough not to trash the place they live in. <laughs> I'd have to throw that in. But, um, you know, but humans, obviously, there's a whole different thing. And you know, the ability to, we don't know if dogs dream, you know, dreams outside of their own awareness or they're just basically doing that. So, I mean, it seems to me pretty obvious that we're, it's definitely a leap. Now, of course, what's the interesting thing is what's the next leap? Okay, in the back here. <laughs> yes. Question about the uh, So the question was about the ships, the Columbus ships, um, where they are looking out and they, they can't see them. We, I first read that in Candace Pert's book. So I asked Candace when I saw her last time, I said, Candace, we've gotten that question quite a bit. I said, where, where did you get that from? She said, well, I read it somewhere and I don't remember. <laughs> so the question is, is it an urban legend or not? So actually, we've been researching that. And I also read it in another book somewhere, and I searched through my whole library looking for it and didn't find it. So, you know, hopefully I didn't go into delusional state and just invent that too. Um, I've, we've since done other research. We've gotten uh, cases where people said there was a similar thing re reported with the Cortez, uh, when Cortez landed in the Indians. Um, there was a whole thing on that. The, the full story goes, the way that they got the, um, this is what I read, is when um, Columbus showed up, he took the priest with him, because that's what you did back then. And the priests eventually learned the language. And they eventually asked them, why did you scream every time we stepped on shore? And then they told them the whole story. So you know, we're still doing research on that, because I know the stories are out there. And that's such an interesting, because when I first read it, I, my first reaction was, no way. Now, since then, I have read uh, reports where people have uh, run into airplanes on interstates. As odd as that sounds, every once in a while, a plane will have a problem. And they have to land, emergency landing, and they'll land on an interstate somewhere. And sure enough, someone driving their Acura just plows right into it. And the state police say, well, why did you run into the, the thing? And they'll say, I didn't see it. And they say, what? They say, well, I didn't see it there. Because again, the brain um, throws stuff out. So it's so completely crazy that there would be an airplane sitting in uh, the passing lane on uh, you know, I-5. <laughs> that the brain just like, whoosh, throws it out and that sort of thing. And there's been other studies that go you know, the same, the same sort of thing, how the brain will just throw out information. My favorite one is the one, people have strokes, and so a different part of the brain gets kind of fried and doesn't really work anymore. And th there's different parts of visual processing. It goes through five layers of processing. And so I saw this one where this person had a stroke, and the only part that seemed to be um, destroyed was the part that does nose recognition. You know, like noses? And so you could go up to this person with a Groucho Marx nose on, with big hairs pointing out the whole thing and have a conversation with them and afterwards walk away and they'd say, did you notice anything strange about Bob? And they'd say, no, what? And they'd say, well, didn't you notice anything about the nose? And they'd say, what about the nose? And they truly just could not see, you know, what was happening on the old noggin there, schnozzle or whatever you call it these days. And so they, they but they could see everything else. I mean, they could look and they'd see the whole room, but when you come up to them, they just couldn't see a nose. So that just suggests that the brain is what pro is the brain is tr fundamentally what sees. It's not your eyes. It's not like the little camera there. It's not like you got the little camera in there and you get to see everything. The brain is constantly throwing stuff out, which to me is why when you see little kids, you see little two-year-old kids, and they'll be in the room and they'll do this sort of thing. <laughs> you know, they do that for a while, and usually mom comes in and says, you know, get real. You know, what are you looking at? Look at my little friend up there. No friend. Get real. You got to get into college someday. <laughs> so the, it's just the brain is always. But I wonder, and of course, the question then: if, if you can only see what you know, how do you ever see something new? Uh, yes. The, the uh, first half of your film is, is the greatest depiction of spirituality I've ever seen on film, other than maybe Bill Murray's. Groundhog Day. <laughs> 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 the the uh, second half seems
seem to me to contradict that spirituality if the matter is our thinking projected into our experience, why do we deify the materiality of the brain? Ah. The reason we have the thing about the brain in there is that the brain, it's to basically show how, how the brain is, is, we use our brain to create our experience. But the big thing is how we can rewire the brain. You know, the brain is, the brain is kind of a processing thing, but the brain, if you get a repetitive, and this is why we go into the addictions. You know, to answer the question, why does uh, bad things happen to good people? Why do you keep creating a reality where you have a boss that's always giving you grief? It's because there's a feedback loop, and it's part of the emotions and the neuropeptides in the brain that you get a neural net that you just keep hitting that over and over again. So the reason we go into the brain thing is because you can say all this nice spiritual stuff, but then the question is, Okay, how do I change? How do I make this, you know, more of my own reality? How do I become something different? And we're showing the brain just to give people the hope that by rewiring it and by you can move those neurons out and plug them back in in a different way, that then basically by doing that, you're going to be, your thinking patterns will change and then you start, the neural nets like, let's say, a sequestral victim where they always get the bad boyfriend. They always get the creepy boyfriend. I want, you know, I always get the creepy boyfriend that always doesn't like anything I do. And they always... Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Should we have a show of hands? Just joking. So, yeah, so, you know, the, the, that, are, are you the creepy boyfriend? Uh, it looks just kind of odd. It's been really great talking to everyone. I guess. So that's why we go into the brain. It's just to show people that they can... Um, unplug and plug into something different and break that repetitive pattern and that's how you start changing and creating something different. It's also the answer, the last question I asked is how do you ever perceive something out of your normal? Your normal, you're just always hitting the old neural nets in there. And uh, actually science used to say that basically the brain didn't create any new nerve cells and that basically once you wired, it was wired. But the recent thing is that we're creating brain cells all the time and it's, you can rewire the brain. And that's really, that's part of the whole changing process. And for some people, and we've gotten emails on this, once they realize they can do this, it gives people a lot of hope. They go, oh, oh, I can just, I can just rewire it, and I can just change things. What's the cause, the brain or thought? What is causal? So the precursor, is it, is it, is it the brain? I would, yeah, yeah, I would say it's the mind. It's the thought, the spirit, is really the thing that starts it up. But, once you start it up, you can get into the feedback loop where basically the, you know, the brain just takes over and pretty soon every time someone cuts you off on the freeway, you know, you're reaching for your 36 magnet. Okay, who can ask a question that has a very short answer? <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Oh, why did we get a deaf character? Well, that's kind of funny. We didn't, we didn't really originally think that. But we had written a script where there wasn't a whole lot of dialogue, a whole lot of dialogue in the dramatic part. So we had all the talking heads. We figured let's show it. So we sent the script out. Everyone, all the actresses turned it down because, as everyone in Hollywood knew, no one was going to come see the movie, and it was weird anyway. <laughs> so we were sitting around wondering what to do, and uh, our casting director put on this thing called Breakdown Service. And Marley's agent read it and said, "He's always looking for things where Marley could could, could do it because she's deaf." And he said, "This is perfect for her." So they call us up and say, well, have you considered Marley? And we said, no. He said, would you like to? And we said, yes. <laughs> so we had the meeting. And it, fundamentally, it got to the point where the three of us looked at each other. And we kind of got the sense that the film was making this decision. We weren't. Or the spirit or whatever. And our roles was just to shut up and let it happen. <laughs> so we said, OK. And we just did a very mild rewrite on the script. And we rewrote it so her being deaf wasn't really an issue. It was just kind of like what kind of clothes you were wearing. Um, and so, now it turns out a lot of people really like that part of the film, but it's just, it's one of those things, again, where the film kind of made the decision and we just got our marching orders and off we went. Let's thank the audience. Good thank you. Thank you.
Six cameras here. <laughs> oh, no kidding. Well, this is the one that actually controlled because uh, I didn't know they would get that angle. Well, that, that was, I'm trying to guess, and that I felt usually with a single person, they're not going to sit still and not see this. Also, you got to hear the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> I just started reading, I couldn't put it down. It's very interesting. It explains exactly what you're talking about in the market of weirdness. And also, I just want to tell you the attendance thing is so skewed because of other ones. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. I know that. And also, she does. Everybody owns these at one That's my way to get on the gravel. She called that Bugs Bunny. Bugs Bunny, but you get down to the right. end for Bugs Bunny. <coughs> I thought about it when you get to the bottom having some weird stuff, but we couldn't, of course, use Bugs. Oh, C12. Oh, yeah, that's what I figured. Okay. some of this at you, you can maybe direct me other people who I could talk okay. with. Well, let's see. I'm, you're, you're here in Boulder? I'm in Denver, but I come in Boulder every day. Because okay. I'm, I'm only here for a couple of days to be and I'm, I'm only here for a day. The best thing to do is, is email me. If you go to whatthebleed.com, yeah. there's some other contact with filmmakers. Right. Say, right. what's your name? Uh, Juliana Gomez. Juliana Gomez. Okay. Okay. So anyway, you owe me 250 pages that hour ago. Oh, you know, that's, nice, that's, so. that's amazing. So yeah, just just do that, and then maybe when I'm back in Boulder sometime. That would be wonderful. And the other thing too is this, that you guys are having a conference the end of this month, mm -hmm. and I saw that an opportunity to volunteer. I'd like to say, yeah. I'd like to do it any way that I could. Here's what you do: get on their website. There's something where you um, email the uh, PR people, uh -huh. and the guy you want to get in touch with is Pavel. P A V E L. Pavel, so Pavel, and then we're all in the kind of volunteer, and he'll see if I hook you up with people who are running. So cool. Great. Okay. Okay. So I'll see you maybe in a month. Wonderful. Look forward to seeing you. Tell the sequel, uh, What the Leap Do We Know? What the Leap Do We Know? Talking about the Leap. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Good seeing you. Thank you. Thank you. 
People, once you, one thing, it sort of takes it out of the misty mumbo jumbo world of kind of, you know, where religion and spirituality has been kind of in there, which tends to be very, can be very flaky. And also for people, personally speaking, that I know that when I know that um, how the brain works, and that by rewinding the brain in a certain way, that that's how you change, to know that there's a mechanism that happens, it makes it easier for me to accept that and do it, because you always build your reality is based on your knowledge. So if you have a bigger knowledge base, it's more, you know, you're much more expansive in doing that. Or for some people, like for the quantum things, you know, realizing that, you know, that the mind does seem to be affecting physical reality. It makes people realize, well, gee, I guess I do have, I am connected to the world, I do change things. So it's something that once you, once you have that knowledge, it's like, you know, you ultimately believe, you know that gravity works. Because you have that knowledge, you, you use that all the time in your life. And so you build your life experience based on the knowledge. And I think when the science says, yes, this is happening, or when science says, um, 
you know, your brain is processing things, so you're not going to see things you don't believe. And once you know that's true, that opens a doorway to say, oh, there's stuff out there that I'm not perceiving, so therefore it's possible. Well, I understand all, all why we study brain chemistry, and, and uh, I got a master's in psychology, so, so you know, I've delved yeah. into all of that. And yet, sometimes I do feel that the science gets twisted uh, and used to to justify things that are way outside the realm of science. I mean, we talked about that the two coexist, and Sagan talked about it, Einstein even you know, talked about it. But in the end, uh, the physicists and the, some of the criticism of, of your work comes from the fact that, uh, uh, that you cannot measure the divinity. You cannot measure